Working for you. A weekly talk radio program which highlights developments of national interest and the activities of your Sinkit Stevens government. Join host Les Roy Williams as he presents news, views, reports, and interviews about everything regarding the activities of the Team Unity government and the building of our communities and the development of Sinkit Stevens. Tune in and call in to interact with your government and share your views regarding the upward forward development of your community and our beautiful Twin Island Federation. Working for you is weekly, every Wednesday live from 1.30 p.m. to 3 p.m. on ZIZ Radio, with FM, and Sugar City FM with rebroadcast on participating stations. Working for you. Good afternoon, and we welcome you to Working for You. I am Les Roy Williams. Thank you very much for joining us on today's program, wherever you are in the world. Today we are going to be discussing matters of health and how we can prevent, and in particular, dengue, fever, and measles, and so on. I have with me officials from the Ministry of Health. I have Dr. Hazel Laws, who is no stranger to this Working for You program. She is the Chief Medical Officer in the Ministry of Health. Dr. Laws, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Thank you for having me this afternoon. Thank you for being here. And I have Dr. Keisha Liddy, who is the Acting Director of Community Health Services. Dr. Liddy, welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here. It is your inaugural appearance, I think, on this program, is it? Yes, it is. Okay, good. I know you will come back. <laughs> <laughs> so we are talking about, we are going to have a discussion on the dengue virus infection, preparedness and response. Um, I think that sometime recently, there was an announcement that the Caribbean can have a dengue um, outbreak. And of course we know that dengue fever or dengue is, is, is a mosquito-borne tropical disease and it is caused by the dengue virus. But why are we discussing this topic at this time, Dr. Laws? Thank you for asking me that question, Mr. Williams. As you are aware, uh, in Jamaica, in about January of this year, they announced that they were experiencing an outbreak of dengue virus fever. Uh, at that time in January, they were experiencing as many as almost 400 cases. And if I'm not mistaken, they documented about six deaths from dengue virus uh, infection. And uh, in Jamaica at this time, as you know, dengue Fever is caused by the individual uh, being infected by the dengue virus and it's transmitted by the female mosquito of the species Aedes aegypti or Aedes albopictus. And so here in St. Kitts, we do have the species Aedes aegypti. And so the, 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 the mosquito, the vector is ever present and uh, the dengue virus is circulating in Jamaica and in other CARICOM territories. So some of our neighbors closer home have also documented confirmed cases of dengue. And so with this increase in activity of the dengue virus and the presence of the vector uh, puts us at risk for a dengue virus infection outbreak. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we've chosen to discuss this topic here this afternoon because it's our responsibility to sensitize the public in terms of what they can do as individuals, as families, and as communities to, to help prevent and prepare for the inevitable. Right, so the, the whole idea is to try to reduce the um the presence of the mosquitoes yes that's the and, ultimate goal right and anything that would would cause the mosquitoes to breed 
yes. and to breed in large numbers. Now, what would some of those things be that would cause mosquitoes to breed in large numbers? And in particular, the two types that you spoke about, the Aedes aegypti, and you spoke about, I can't even pronounce the name, another one. <laughs> It is Albopictus. <laughs> it was Albopictus. Yes, mm. yes, yes. Uh, as far as I know, uh, we, we, we are not... Has it been confirmed that we do have Aedes Albopictus? There's a program done by the Ross University where they attempted to identify the various species of mosquitoes that we have habitating here in St. Kitts and Nevis. They identified the Albopictus, yes, which is a l mosquito that causes dengue fever to a lesser extent, but it's more related to areas where we have, yes, a used tires, because this oh, okay. mosquito mm -hmm. actually loves that breeding site. So that's in the cornery yes. area. Yes, so then. you'll be at the landfill yeah. and yeah. and all sites where there are tires aren't tested, but for sure at the landfill where they have tires. So actually it can breed outside of water? Yes, that's Is that the it? peculiarity about that species. It's it's uh, it flourishes or proliferates due to rainfall or water, but it can resist um, dry temperatures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So drying does not um, encourage it to disappear. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So we have to reduce though all those used tires and so that we have around the place. So that's a challenge. Yes. That's yes. a challenge. Because on the landfill we have thousands of tires. Yes. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And so therefore they would breed there and they can travel elsewhere. Yeah, the mosquitoes. The yes. mosquitoes, they, yes. they travel. Yes. Some, they yes. can travel in swarms. Yes. Uh -huh. yes. Uh -huh. Just to give a sense of clarification, however, mosquitoes aren't the primary source of transference of the, the disease. What happens, the mosquito will inhabit the close by areas and maybe will travel about 100 meters away from where their habitat is. But once that mosquito bites a, a person at that place, and that individual now who is infected with the can dengue virus then can then go to another community or travel, and then a other mosquito can bite that person, get infected, and continue the transmission. So not the oh. particular mosquitoes, mosquitoes going, as a traveling family traveling. Oh. Yes, yes. yes. I see. So there is an incubation period? Yes. yes. Is there an incubation period? I suppose yes. we'll get to yes. that. But, yes. but when was the last outbreak of dengue virus infection in the Federation? We had our mm -hmm. last outbreak in about 2011. And at that time, we had approximately almost 100 suspected cases and almost 50 laboratory confirmed cases of dengue virus at that time. And uh, based on the report that we received from CAFO, after that outbreak settled, uh, they confirmed that the dengue virus too. So there are different, there are four serotypes mm -hmm. to the dengue virus. So at that time, we had the dengue virus serotype 2 circulating in the Federation at that time. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and do you have any sort of uh, statistics in terms of how many people were affected? Um, at that time? Yes. A hundred, almost a hundred suspected cases. Almost a hundred. And almost 50 co laboratory confirmed cases okay. in 2011. Okay. Yes. And maybe we could put a bullet point and... and explain here what is the difference between a suspected case and a confirmed mm -hmm. case. So a suspected case of dengue fever would be an individual having been infected by the mosquito with the dengue virus presents now with clinical symptoms that suggest that this is a case of dengue. And those symptoms would be fever for one, which would be a high grade fever, and any two of the following, a headache, pain behind the eye, muscular or uh, body aches, nausea, vomiting, swollen glands or lymph nodes, and a rash. So any two plus the fever. So if you present to your physician with fever, headache, and vomiting, they may suspect after eliminating some differential diagnosis that this is dengue. Right, so so that's a suspected case. A confirmed case is now where a sample is taken from that individual, that ill person, sent to the lab, to test for the dengue virus itself, and if that test comes back as positive, then it's a laboratory confirmed case. So we are dealing with multi-symptoms? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
it can't just be one thing. It's it's a multiplicity. Of, it's a, it's yes. a combination of things yes. Um, yes. that that you're looking for. Yes. Mm. No, is there a vaccine against dengue fever? Is there any vaccine at all? There is. Yeah, is. yeah there yeah. is a vaccine, but there are specific recommendations from the World Health Organization as to the use of the vaccine. Um, for it, for an important thing to note is an individual who will be offered the vaccine would actually be a person who have already had the dengue virus before. Because what they found is that if you uh, never been infected with the virus and then receives the vaccine, then you actually get a worse case of oh. the infection. Mm -hmm. So they ab advise to use a cohort of individuals who have been previously infected to get the vaccination to prevent reinfection because the, the key thing to note is if you are infected with a particular dengue virus serotype, serotype mm -hmm. and we've mentioned that there were four then you only attain lifelong natural immunity to that specific serotype so if you had dengue virus 2 like we said in our outbreak in 2011 then you will have natural immunity against dengue virus 2 However, if you become infected now with dengue virus 3, which is on our borders, as we said in Jamaica, then you can then again have the infection and the disease, and it may even be a case where you can persist to have any severe form of the viral infection, which is the dengue hemorrhagic fever. Oh, so hemorrhagic. When you hear anything about hemorrhagic, it's bleeding, bleeding. isn't it? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh -huh. so, so there's internal bleeding, is that yes. what happens? Uh -huh. mm. So persons who develop the severe form of dengue virus infection, otherwise uh, termed dengue hemorrhagic fever, mm -hmm. uh, they usually experience severe abdominal pain, uh, nausea, vomiting, and they may start to, to bleed from their mucosa, nosebleeds, uh, even from the eyes, mm -hmm. eyes, uh, they can vomit. Uh, the vomitus can also uh, have blood mixed mm -hmm. in it, and uh, PR bleeding, bleeding from the rectum. All right. So individuals who would have developed the severe form, yes, they do have uh, bleeding problems. But the key thing is to to remember that only a small percentage of persons who are impacted by dengue virus infection uh, would develop the severe form. I think it less yes, than 4%, 1%. Percent. no, case fatality is 1%, okay. uh, but it, less than 4% go on to develop mm -hmm. dengue hemorrhagic fever, and only a smaller percentage, less than 1%, would actually uh, die uh, from it. So it's important for us to remember that the deaths from dengue fever uh, virus is the, by and large preventable. Mm -hmm. It's best to pick up the red flag signs early. So if you have a, a, a case, a person who you suspect to have dengue virus and you know and they are complaining of severe abdominal pain and vomiting, you know, con persistent vomiting, those are red flag signs. Those individuals should be sent to the hospital right away. They should be admitted aggressively managed and in so doing you can reduce uh, the possibility of, of uh, ICU admission and even death. So the deaths from dengue are by and large preventable but it's for us clinicians, the nurses, the doctors to pick up the red flag signs and manage those cases ag uh, aggressively. Now, now who are the people that are most vulnerable to get in dengue fever? Uh, anybody? I think, yeah, I think vulnerability would be Depends. the persons where the mosquito density is, is high, highest. Where we yes. would want to know, to make sure we highlight prevention right. and source reduction. Yeah. Because it wouldn't, the virus wouldn't differentiate or discriminate between 
infants, child, anybody, diabetic, adult. It's just anybody. Anybody. Okay. Is at I, risk. I know. I know there are some illnesses you will get them mm -hmm. because your system is already compromised. Okay. So it's easier to get. That is what oh, I was so getting. Oh, so what you are at. asking then is uh, if individuals are impacted by the dengue virus, if there are other, if the individual also has underlying medical conditions, they that can increase their risk of of developing or going on to the, the more serious form. That they is, that is, have, what, that is yes. what I'm, I'm asking. Because if you are diabetic uh, or you're immunocompromised in any way and you pick up the virus, yes, you would be at risk for other significant problems. Okay. Yeah. But any and everybody, you are at risk children mm -hmm. adults older adults are at risk of the virus mm -hmm. uh -huh. but the risk is increased if you are living or dwelling in an area with a high uh, density, density of mosquitoes mm -hmm. so we always hear the 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 old adage uh -huh. an ounce of prevention <laughs> is worth a pound of cure <laughs> You always said so. So the, the, the focus must be on prevention, prevention yes. and um, preparing for the inevitable dengue virus outbreak. You said it's you know there's an outbreak in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. Jamaica is in the Caribbean. It's yeah. close. We have people that go to Jamaica all the time. People that mm -hmm. come back here mm -hmm. um, and so on. So we have to reduce the mosquito habitats. Yes. 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 And to, to limit the exposure to bites, yes. how are we going to do that? What advice would you have for the public? <laughs> <laughs> I, I know that the Ministry of Health works hand in hand with the um, they go around with the fogging, yeah, they have and the all environmental, the environmental health, health department. Health department. Uh, the, the environmental health department really provides oversight to our vector control program. And that's their their mandate to to, to keep uh, to monitor uh, the, the, the 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 vector indices, and so uh, the, the the vector control officers they visit the communities, mm -hmm. uh, the homes, the premises, and they report on the house index in terms of uh, the percentage of homes with at least one container positive with the the larvae of the mosquito and they also report the Bretto index meaning the number of containers per 100 households visited uh, the number of containers positive with the larva mm -hmm. right and so recently we had uh, our epidemiologists uh, provided us with some data we had increased indices in uh, districts 2, two 3, three five, 5, and 8. eight. Uh, Central Bastille, West Bastille, uh, the Sandy Point area. Mm -hmm. uh, those were the, the main areas. And so with this information, our vector control officers use this data and they, 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 they target these communities. They visit the homes and the, the, the individuals, educate them in terms of ridding their immediate premises with uh, water containers, garbage is also a, a source of, of, of uh, a problem in terms of the mosquito and its lava. All right, and so the, the vector control officers go into the communities and the aim is source reduction, uh, reducing the, improving the immediate environment of the individuals in these communities of of the containers where the larvae of the mosquitoes grow all right and so we said look look at the plastic containers the bags in your house around your home look at your flower vases look at your flower pots the saucers in which you keep the pots because the water sometimes settle and that's a source of 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 a habitat for the larva of the aedes aegypti mosquito all right fountains some persons have uh, man-made water fountains in the yard, in their homes. You need to make sure it's well, it's frequently cleaned so that you can rid yourselves of the lava of the mosquito. Your garbage receptacles needs to be properly kept. Uh, sometimes water after the rain uh, settles and is also a source of a breeding site for the mosquitoes. Tires in and around the homes. 
uh, large buckets, basins of water. You may be storing water for whatever the purpose. It really should be in a sealed container so that the mosquito doesn't enter so that you would have larvae. So you need to make sure the water containers are sealed or just get rid of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Your laundry basins, even the, the, the gutter uh, for, on your roofs needs to be cleaned regularly because you can have mosquito larvae uh, there also. And uh, keeping your lawn, your vegetation in your yard and around your homes cut, trimmed. So these are some steps that as individuals, as families, and as communities, you can engage in. Or these are actions that you can take to reduce the risk or reduce the population of the mosquito in and around your homes. Sometimes you are a very tidy neighbor, but your neighbor is very nasty. They don't keep their surroundings clean. They don't keep their yard clean. They don't cut the, the, you know, the lot of weeds in their yard and so on. How do you go about that? It's all about awareness. Mm -hmm. So I have yes. to make my neighbor aware yes. that they have yes. to keep their surroundings clean. Yes. 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 So the yes. inspection by the vector control officer or health environmental officer would not only entail inspecting the home of the individual who they're targeting, maybe if that was a... Uh, a case that they visited last week, but they will look at the immediate environment, as you said. If there's an abandoned um, plot where the grass is overgrown to this height and water can be there settled, that also needs to be addressed. So they would have to find out who's the owner for that plot, find out if they're going to be able to clean it, or mandate that they actually cut the lawn. So as, as you said, it's not just you yourself, but it's your immediate environment. What is your neighbor doing as well? So mm -hmm. the education and the public awareness involves that exactly. Making so in sure this the case, you can mind your neighbor's business. In this yes, case, yes. good business yes. is yes. not. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Because it can affect yes, you. Yes, of course. And it can affect your neighbor of as well. Course, and yes. they need to know. And it's a public health issue. And so uh, in so doing, you're protecting yourself and your immediate community. Mm -hmm. yes. Now, in terms of the process. There are other things you could do too in terms of in your homes. Uh, you could decide to install uh, the, screens the screens and over your windows and your doors. Yes. You know, that too can keep out the mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. And then on a personal note, you can determine or decide to use a, a personal repellent, yeah, yeah? To, to, to repel mm -hmm. the mosquitoes. So you can, there are actions you can take community-wide, uh, decisions and interventions within the home and personal actions sure. that you can take to protect yourself. Sure. Uh -huh. Now in terms of the process, we, we spoke about the larvae and you know you're having water or tires and so on mm -hmm. and then it has to go through a process. There's from larvae to mosquito. Mm -hmm. How long a process is that? Because sometimes we call these things wigglers. <laughs> sometimes you have water and you see a little thing wiggling in the water. Yes. <laughs> Well, that and you, you know, have to pick my brain on a little bit more. Yeah, Probably I get back to you with the exact. Yeah, I don't remember the exact time and the, uh, life the life cycle. cycle. The life cycle, right? Uh -huh, because it goes from the eggs to the larvae to the pupae, pupae to the adult, adult mosquito. mosquito. To the adult, yes. and, the, and then what is the lifespan of the mosquito? How long can oh, it live? The lifespan. Oh. We really needed the yes. environmental health officer here. But are you asking that? Um, to find out if this is an infected mosquito, how long can it continue? I know it can continue infecting for the rest, for the rest of, of, of the life of the mosquito. But as you uh -huh. said, how long would that mosquito live? Because I used to hear that sometimes when a mosquito bites you, Let me hear. some people say that it dies. My husband said that last week. I said, yeah. no, it does not. <laughs> I've uh, heard that before. For this, uh, it says here, after an incubation period of about four to ten mm. days, the infected female mosquito of the eight species Aedes aegypti is capable of transmitting the virus for the rest of its life. Its life. So the life. So it doesn't just mm. die after biting mm. you. No. Uh huh. So it's a female one that it's is It's a female. Dead. Yes, it's a female mosquito of the of the Aedes aegypti species. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you laughing, Mr. Williams? The, 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 this is an aside, but I saw something the other day. You had this, uh, this seahorse. Uh -huh. And do you know that it's a male seahorse that carries the babies? 
Okay. Oh, interesting. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. And gives birth to the babies, the male. Okay. Okay, so the Ministry of Health is is monitoring um, the dengue situation locally, as you would have indicated. Um, so, what actually happens when the lab, the health department, confirms a case of dengue virus infection? What happens when you've confirmed the case? Okay, so remember that picture I painted earlier of that individual um, having clinical signs or symptoms that suggest and then the sample is taken off sent to the lab for confirmatory testing so fortunately in our setting when we do get back that result just on a note to know what's the prognosis or the status of the patient that client may or most of the time have already been discharged from the healthcare facility have been treated um, rehabilitated and discharged home. So we now have a confirmatory diagnosis. This is now red flagged by the lab staff and uh, given out as surveillance data in a weekly epidemiological surveillance data to the epidemiol- epidemiologists and the staff at the health information unit. And then we sit as a group um, monthly or twice monthly and we go through this data to continue watching the trends. We not only look at the confirmatory t- test results, but also the all cases, cases of um, yes, fever, undifferentiated fever and suspected cases. So there's ongoing monitoring. surveillance and monitoring of that information. The actual number of cases suspected, confirmed each week. Um, the indices, that, as we alluded to before, which is the household index, container index, brutal index, all of this is gathered and analyze so we can mobilize our team and change our strategy on the ground in terms of the vector control program. Mm -hmm. Now what would be... um, (coughs) So we use this information to determine where the vector control officers are deployed and we use this information to determine when we fog and the areas we fog. Mm -hmm. Uh, We determine what are the high risk areas and these areas we focus on on a weekly basis. So in other words, our our actions, our interventions are guided by data Mm -hmm. that we collect. Okay. Right. So it's data driven. Yes, Yes. data driven. It it is data driven. Yes. Now in terms of your um, the general public, I think we spoke about how they can prevent how they can try to prevent the 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 um the infection because the infection is caused by a virus, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. <coughs> and it is the mosquito that carries the virus. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, the, the term carrier, just a little clarification. The mosquito, if the mosquito is infected with the virus, the human is actually the carrier, as I explained before. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. The mosquito is the vector. Oh. That yes. takes it that from takes one it individual to, to the another. other individual. Uh-huh. So yes. the human carries the virus, another mosquito can bite that infected human, and that mosquito being then infected bites now bites another person. Oh. And transmits it. Now I'm getting it. The yes. mosquito is the vector. The vector. Yes, that carries it. That yes. carries it. Yes. yes. Mm-hmm. And the from human one person to, to the to, other. To the other. Mm-hmm. Oh. Okay. The human is the carrier for the virus. Mm-hmm. So once you have an infected human and a mosquito bites that person, that mosquito can now go on and bite another. Okay. I, I, I often look at that situation <coughs> to red flag my experience of working in the health sector where the cases of infected persons or dengue fever cases would be in that vicinity, that area. So mosquitoes around the hospital and healthcare facilities is a concern because the, the infected individuals are right there. They're being mm-hmm. bedded, they're being cured for, they're being managed. So mosquitoes anywhere around any healthcare facility is, is a danger because they all can go away with the, the virus. And so that's why, just to follow up on your comment, uh, that's why uh, if there is a, if God forbid there is an outbreak, uh, we would have uh, ascertained the nets, the bed, the mosquito mm-hmm. nets. Mm-hmm. Some of them are insecticide uh, with insecticide, and they are the, those nets are advisable for patients who are hospitalized. And so if you really have 
uh, a patient who confirmed dengue virus in the hospital with dengue hemorrhagic fever, they should really be on a bed with a hospital net mm -hmm. uh, to protect uh, and, you know, a mosquito coming, biting the individual, and then going, going to bite uh, another another patient mm -hmm. in the same ward or in another ward. So, that so that's important. That is how it would be spread. Yes, that's how it would be spread. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Now, there are several mosquito-borne illnesses. <laughs> and sometimes I wonder if they're by different areas of the world because sometimes we hear about malaria yes but we don't we don't have malaria in these parts do we uh no not 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 only we have a few imported mm. cases sometimes that right. we manage uh yeah we but that is cases. that is mainly over in africa yes in africa yeah and then we've heard the case of chikungunya okay that's also and uh transmitted by the same yeah, mosquito the aedes aegypti mm -hmm. and so you find um Recent, as I said, the last outbreak of dengue was in 2011, but subsequent to that, we had the chikungunya outbreak in about 2015, 2014, 2015, and then subsequent to that, we had the Zika virus outbreak that started in about September mm -hmm. to the last quarter of 2016. So it's the same mosquito, but three different viruses. Yeah? Wow. So the clinical picture for the three they have some similarities but they are different in some ways for example uh the fever that you get with dengue virus i think is higher uh, than the others with the zika virus you have you get our typical rash uh, most of the cases of dengue virus you don't usually get uh, a rash you really get the high fever the severe pain behind the eyes headache malaise and then the patient can go on to have uh, the bleeding disorder. So there are some similarities but there are some differences. But the Aedes aegypti mosquito which we do have here is the vector for the three. Dengue virus, chikungunya virus and the Zika virus. Wow. And so our vector <coughs> control program we, has, we, it's a, we are working assiduously to strengthen that program on a continuous basis because if we are successful in keeping our mosquito densities down we would thereby reduce the risk of any of these yes. uh, infections is there any way for example in a lab that you can probably have some genetically modified mosquitoes or something to cut down on i don't know that's being worked on it has been worked on? Yeah, I think, yeah, uh -huh. genetically mod modified mosquitoes. But there's some <coughs> controversy where that is concerned, yeah, in terms of the long-term effects of, of, of these, these mosquitoes and uh, the natural environment, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because I wonder, how does the mosquito determine? Well, look, I'm going to... It's the same mosquito. Yes, three different viruses. <laughs> and three different viruses. So it is, but this is chikungunya this time, mm. Zika this time, oh. or... Well, you realize that they are going in cycles. Yes. Uh -huh. Because cycles. 2011, we had dengue. 2014, 2015, chikungunya. And then Zika, Zika. 2016. Now we are back dengue. around to being at risk for dengue. So now we are in a cycle for dengue. And then I think it's going to follow after this wears off, we're going to be approaching, yeah, uh, uh, there'll be an increased risk in chikungunya, and then in another two or three years, increased risk of Zika again. Because what you have, what you have is uh, persons within your communities who are impacted, developing the natural immunity to that virus oh. for a time period. And then after a number of years, that herd immunity falls and the population then becomes at risk for the, the, uh, the virus circulating again. Mm -hmm. So it's going in cycles. <laughs> it's interesting. <laughs> these, <laughs> these mosquitoes, they are so small. small yes, yes, but they are, yeah. But they do so much damage. <laughs> and I often ask myself, what are their biological purpose? Other than biting me or you <laughs> and taking a bit oh, of blood. Oh, why did God create them? 
And then this That's is actually the, the same of, way. It's actually the same way, you know. But I suppose you're all a part of the ecology, the ecosystem, the ecosystem. Yes, yes. And, yes. and we, so we only have the, the vision of them as a blood sucker taking a, a drink. But maybe we need to be educated on their. I get the sense that there are other animals who eat them. Mm. I don't okay. know. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, yes, yeah. that's true. Yeah, oh. that's true. Yeah. That's true. Maybe. Mm -hmm. And they are so, so they're annoying. So Sometimes you want to sleep and this one mosquito <laughs> and it's making so much noise. It always comes by your ear. Yeah. Why do they always go by your ear? Is there something that, some waves or something that pull them in? I don't have the answer to that one. <laughs> no, there must be something about the ears because they buzz around the ears. Do you notice that? Yes, yes, yes. Is it that yes. they buzz in there or that's how we are aware of them? Because we can hear it. But they they actually elsewhere as well. Cause you That's a philosophical down, yeah. question, but it always <laughs> seems to me as though they like your ears. They, you, you know, they it. like they yeah. like to bite you on your ear <laughs> 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 and to make a lot of noise. Now, in terms of the source reduction and how everyone can eliminate mosquito breeding sites, how can we go about that? Source reduction. What is meant by source reduction? Eliminating uh, those containers and areas in and around your home where the larva of the mosquito uh, survives and lives. So mm -hmm. each, I think it's everybody's responsibility to do a walkthrough mm -hmm. today mm -hmm. of your home and look for all those areas in your house where the, the, the Aedes aegypti mosquito larva can dwell, mm -hmm. yeah? Even the little fountain, those of us who have the water fountains, there's a little tray down the bottom oh, yeah. where there's, there's always a little puddle of water. Don't take it for granted. You need to w take that tray out, wash it frequently to, to get rid of any larvae that may be present. And so each of us need to walk through our homes and rid our homes of all those plastic containers or containers in general where the, the, the lava can survive. Yeah, yes? that, that can't be underscored enough. Now, when you've been diagnosed with dengue fever, what medication do you take for that? Okay, there's no specific treatment for dengue fever. The, hall, yeah, the hallmark would be to make sure that the fluid okay. um, volume, there's no deficit. It's like when you have a cold, but you have to, by our flu, yes. you have to take things yes. for the pain and yes. Yes. inflammation so and all of that. So there are a few basic things that you do, yes. Re hydration, maintain mm. your hydration status. Mm -hmm. You may take at least paracetamol mm -hmm. for the fever and body aches, but it's advised not to take, take aspirin. aspirin, ibuprofen, or anything of the class called non-steroidal inflammatory drugs because they actually increase the risk of bleeding, which we underscored already is a complication of the viral infection. Mm -hmm. And when we say hydration, sometimes because of the other symptoms, the vomiting, you may not be able to take fluid orally. So mm -hmm. this is where an individual may need to have intravenous fluid replacement that will be at a healthcare facility, the hospital. That's what we call IV or drips. And, and such a person also needs, the, the physician, the attending physician also needs to monitor, monitor. their complete blood count, including their platelet count. Because uh, the platelets uh, can give an indication as to the development of the severe form yes. of dengue. Mm -hmm. So it's important for the attending physician to monitor the individual's complete blood count. Mm -hmm. Now, if left untreated, what's the worst case scenario? You mentioned fatality, but it's not the norm. Not very common. Because even though you are infected with the virus and acquire dengue fever, your body has the ability to, to get it yes. yeah. yeah within yes. a, a week uh, yes. about seven seven days, your body will shake days. it off yes, yes. naturally seven day, naturally seven days naturally yes so you will feel the effects yes but you can go untreated in a clinical setting 
and be able to recuperate. Mm -hmm. Actually, mm -hmm. most patients do. Just drink Most and persons rest. recover um, within about seven to eight days. Mm -hmm. With maybe just Panadol, yes, acetaminophen, fluids. Uh, and fluids and bed rest. Right, if, yes. you, if you have a good system, yes, uh -huh. yes. Good, really, yes. a good immune system, system and all of that, yes. you will just shake it off. Yes. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh -huh. now, now, it is so important, some of these things, because they affect the workplace. Mm -hmm. Yes. And they affect productivity. Mm -hmm. If you're going to have people getting sick mm -hmm. and so on, you have less, less productivity. Um, families are affected, so you you look at that side of the whole thing too. If somebody gets sick, but I mean they're not coming into work. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it affects mm -hmm. it affects that. So yes, a, a dengue outbreak can have an impact on the workforce yes. and the productivity mm -hmm. because if you have an increase in number of persons affected by the virus. They may have to be away from each um, affected person may need to be away from work for about a week. Uh, yes. And so productivity will be affected. Just pause and reflect on what happened during Zika. I mean, there were I mean, a number, an increased number of persons were impacted. They couldn't go to work. Right. And you had uh, an increased amount of absenteeism. And production was affected. Yes. And so that's why the Ministry of Health, that's why we are here this afternoon. Uh, and the aim is to sensitize the public. We're not telling you anything new. No. I'm sure you would have remembered these messages from the previous outbreak. Mm -hmm. But it's just to remind the persons that these are some actions that you as an individual can take to prevent the outbreak. Because if we are active and proactive in, 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 in eliminating the, the breeding sites of these mosquitoes, we may get an outbreak, but it may not be significant. It may only impact a small number of persons. Mm -hmm. And so that's our aim. Yes. Mm -hmm. To reduce the impact. Mm -hmm. All right. The, the evidence tells us that it's inevitable. So let's reduce the impact, right. the severity of the outbreak. Right. Now, recently, the Ministry of Health sent out an advisory with respect to influenza. Is it the H1N1? What was it? What's, oh, that is bird flu. What's the H1N1? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know this medical term. But you sent out the common, it's the common influenza. Is it the flu? Okay. Yes. What we call the flu. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, uh, again, you know, we are approaching the end of the flu season which is springtime is approaching and that usually brings the flu season to an end. However, in North America, they are finding out or realizing that the, 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 the activity of the influenza virus is still pretty high, even though we are approaching the end of the flu season. And therefore, well, in the, the flu, the influenza, is really caused by three different types of virus influenza A, B, and C. Influenza C really causes a mild infection that you don't really need to comment about. And so of concern, of public health concern, are uh, influenza A and B. Mm -hmm. Now in circulation, you have two subtypes A, H1N1, H3N2, all right? Now, the H1N1 has been of particular interest in the Caribbean because some Caribbean territories, again Jamaica and I think St. Lucia and I think probably Trinidad have documented cases or uh, have received confirmed, lab confirmed cases of H1N1. Is that the avian flu? What's that? I don't know. What is it? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, as again I said, a type of, a subtype of the influenza A okay. virus. Uh, people tend to use swine flu synonymous with H1N1. I try not to because swine flu speaks to a, a particular a uh, subtype of the influenza A virus that impacts swine or pigs, yes? But in this case, I, it's not synonymous. 
all right it's the subtype h1n1 mm -hmm. uh, that's impacting humans in the caribbean at this time some islands have documented deaths related to h1n1 and so we thought it important to again sensitize the public how can you prevent yourself contracting the flu all right and some simple things if you notice your co-workers at work coughing and sneezing one you need to recommend that he or she gets treatment or he or she should really stay home and and not spread it because that's how it spread by yes. the, the, the droplets from the coughing and the sneezing being inhaled by somebody else yeah and so if you are impacted you really need to cover your nose and your mouth when coughing sneezing make sure your hands are kept clean so hand washing is important um as i said stay home you get sick leave stay home yeah. uh rest lead living healthily so adequate rest adequate hydration eating healthily boosts your immune system and so if your neighbor has it you may not necessarily contract it yeah so these are just some simple steps to 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 prevent yourself contracting it and to pre prevent the spread controlling right. the spread of the influenza virus i, I know this here they see the flu mm -hmm. seems to peak at certain times for example after carnival and things like that you hear mm -hmm. all the people say they're coming down with flu yes. i don't know what's the reason for that is because people are in close proximity with each other and so therefore things can spread diseases can spread easily, yes. can spread easily and so on mm -hmm. um but some people i mean they really spoke about this flu season some of them call the flu Tata. <laughs> okay. That was the name this year? Tata? That was oh, the name yes, this year. Yes. Tata. Yes. And they say it was really bad. Yes. And if you know Tata, the Calypso and so on. But, yeah. you know. And again, it's important to note that uh, I, most persons who contract the flu will get over it mm -hmm. quite quickly, within a few days, without any problems. However, there are some individuals who are already diagnosed with other underlying problems, if they were to contract the flu, I would recommend that they seek medical care mm -hmm. because if you have diabetes, for example, if you are HIV positive, for example, if you already have chronic renal disease and contract the flu, your, your immunocompromised state I uh, may not be able to fight off the, the influenza virus and you are at risk of developing complications like pneumonia, which is a significant or severe lung infection. Some persons have to be admitted to the ICU mm -hmm. and regrettably <laughs> some persons can die. And so if you are an older adult, 65 years and over, and if you have another underlying medical condition like diabetes, HIV, uh, chronic renal disease, even congestive heart failure, seek medical care. Because again, if you are managed properly uh, and aggressively, you, you don't necessarily have to experience the complications. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And also, in addition to <coughs> the measures that we use for prevention, we spoke about public education, having individuals be aware of what they can do to prevent getting the influenza. But we also have the vaccine. the vaccine, the flu vaccine available for particular individuals because of the, you, you, you um, avail, have it available for a cohort so that you can sustain that effect. So the cohort would be children, um, adults greater than 65 years, and our adults who are affected by chronic diseases such as diabetes and hypertension. Mm -hmm. And pregnant um, clients, so and, the, and the frontline health workers, and frontline health mm -hmm. workers. Yes, yes, yeah. those are involved. Yes, yeah. the, you, yeah. you, you, you are at risk. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. I forgot myself. So they, those, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, <laughs> they actually had to take. It. Yes. So yeah. you have you have to make sure that the yes. immune system is in yes. top yes. shape. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. And do everything to protect and it's yourself not as just well in from our area because mm -hmm. I also had the vaccine when I worked in Trinidad and you would have had the yes, vaccine. In yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. so also there's a flu vaccine. Yeah, there is a, a flu, flu vaccine. vaccine. And this was actually approved for St. Kitts and Nevis yes. in 2018. Mm -hmm. And so, well, let me just say mm -hmm. the best prevention for the flu is actually the flu vaccine. 
Yes, and it's advised that persons uh, should, like those older than 65, uh, the adults with chronic illnesses, frontline workers and pregnant females, mm -hmm. they are the ones who it's approved for locally and it's available uh, in any health center. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So the vaccination, the flu vaccine is the best preventive measure in terms of preventing the flu. So you can go to the, the health center and ask for and the ask flu vaccine. And ask for the flu vaccine. Any wow. health center in St. Kitts and Nevis. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Good idea. Now, <clears throat> we've been hearing a lot on the news about measles. I thought we had passed that stage a long time ago when it comes to measles because we were vaccinated as children, yeah. I think, um, against measles. I know I have this um, thing on my hand. It's Almost BCG. every child has it. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's, it's like a scar. A, from BCG. A scar. Yeah. What, is is no. that for the measles? No, no, BCG. That is BCG. Yeah, tuberculosis. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. But why it gives you a scar? I wonder why. It's because a localized reaction. reaction and it is yeah. a scar. Or it's just a localized yeah. reaction. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it heals with that scar. Yes. Oh, I see. Yeah. But, but it's useful for us as healthcare yes, providers we know because you check <laughs> to make that. So you know that person would have received the their BCG vaccine. Sometimes so the person is unaware or they don't remember. And they may not <laughs> have I mean, the they would know because they were a child and the mother. They would but know. the scar is yes, so yes, you know that they would have yes, received yes, it. Yes. yes okay. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and then the measles. We are vaccinated for measles as. So, yes, in our national program, uh, all children age one year. Uh, they are supposed to be vaccinated, receive their first uh, measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, the MMR1 vaccine. Mm -hmm. And then at 18 months, one year and a half, they are supposed to receive their second dose of the what we call the MMR, measles, mumps, rubella uh, vaccine. And so that's standard, all right? Um, and, and I must commend the staff, mm -hmm. our public health staff, because we have attained a coverage, a vaccination coverage of 98% for MMR2 at present yes. and 97% uh, regarding MMR1. And that is good because if, God forbid, we have an imported case of measles, mm -hmm. because we have such a high coverage rate, the chance of it uh, having a local spread is reduced to a minimum wow and so i am i must commend our nurses our public health nurses who actually go out and mm -hmm. seek these children and make sure that they are vaccinated and so our coverage as i let me repeat mmr 197 percent federation wide and um uh, MMR to 98% federation wise and this is important because if any of all of us must have listened to the news this morning and must have heard that there is an outbreak of measles in New York I'm surprised because I mean and they're supposed to have top-notch medical um, systems and all that sort of Can a thing I tell you there is an increasing number of persons in that setting and regrettably in our setting uh, who are not given consent to their children being immunized against measles mm -hmm. and so in New York right now there are almost about what 250 cases of measles between over the last six to nine months and it's it's predominantly in the Jewish community whereby you have a, a high percentage of parents who did not give consent for their children to be vaccinated and so it's in it's the unvaxed the outbreak is in has it, it involves the unvaccinated children all right and so i think this is a wonderful opportunity for us to educate the public that yes uh there are persons who are you know refusing parents that is who are refusing to vaccinate their children but the flip side is that if th that unvaccinated child is exposed to the virus, they are at serious risk of picking up the infection and the infection has serious complications. Mm -hmm. Because a number, a big percentage of the 250 cases were admitted 
and to ICU in New York. And so a public health emergency was declared in New York today to the point where they are doing uh, contact tracing of the contacts. And uh, if you are not already ill, you have to be, it's mandatory to be vaccinated. Mm -hmm. And there's a fine. Persons know, the parents are being fined over a thousand US dollars if they are non compliant with vaccination. That is how serious it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because then it becomes a public health. Mm -hmm. Disaster. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Guess one person traveled from New York to Michigan and just that one individual imported it into Michigan and you have a number of persons now infected with the measles virus in Michigan. So there are implications for us. Of course. I mean we live in a you know, a global village. Yes. We depend uh, on the tourists. We depend on the tourists so and, 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 and our a large market, North America. North market. America, yes. And so it's just a flight away. And so for us, we, we have to maintain our high coverage just in case we have a, a, an imported case. But having said that, just this morning in one of our meetings, we made a decision that we have to increase monitoring at our ports of entry. Mm -hmm. We already monitor the cruise, the cruise lines. Uh, every cruise ship that docks in the mornings uh, and one of our one or two of our environmental health officers, they go on board and they check the maritime declaration of health form. Form. Okay. Right, which which highlights <laughs> if there are any ill persons on board. So yes. we already monitor. So this is part of your vector management and control yes. program. Yes, we monitor in our mm. ports. Yes. yes. We have to. We have to. And so at the airports now, at least for the next two to three weeks, we have to deploy staff members to monitor uh, particularly the straight flights coming in uh, from the US. Right, it, yes. it, you know, it is so interesting because because of the world that we live in, mm -hmm. things can be transported yeah. and transported- In an hour, two hours, just a flight. Transported quickly. Yes, yes, yes. Sometime last week, I was invited to a, a meeting at the agricultural conference room and it had to do with something similar except that it had to do with plants okay. people transporting plants and animals mm -hmm. don't pack a pest mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah very important mm -hmm. yeah you know mm -hmm. and how you can carry different diseases plant mm -hmm. diseases and mm -hmm. crop diseases mm -hmm. and and animal diseases and all that sort of a thing you know mm -hmm. that's very important mm -hmm. and so that's why there are some jurisdictions where there are policies whereby the plant has to be approved yes. in country uh, and you get a certificate right. that clears the plant and our animal right before it is allowed in the other jurisdiction right and so these are policies that we really need to consider mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we think of any sort of a virus let's look so let's just think it was HIV free at one time. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Back in the 80s. Yes, yes, we were HIV free. Yes. yes. But then, of course, we are not. Mm -hmm. And so, all that would have happened is that somebody would have first contracted it and then it spread. You know, it could have been the person would have gone outside of St. Kitts, mm -hmm. contracted it, brought it back pass it on to others. Mm -hmm. We don't know. Yes. But at the very same time, the whole discussion mm -hmm. and, and, and movement must be in the reduction. Of yes. course, of spread. And so, as the Ministry of Health, we, we often say that the chronic non-communicable diseases uh, is responsible for many of our deaths and morbidity illnesses. However, we cannot forget the infectious diseases mm -hmm. because they are ever present with us. And so today we are not talking about the chronic illnesses, mm -hmm. we are talking about infectious diseases because mm -hmm. already you've asked me questions about dengue. <laughs> yes. You've had me mention chicken gunya. Chicken gunya you've Zika. mentioned Zika. You it, the flu, and influenza, now we are talking and now you tell me measles. measles. <laughs> so the, the, the infectious diseases are they are they are present. They are always present and and uh, as the Ministry of Health, we have to provide oversight in terms of the control, prevention, and the control of these infectious diseases. Right. And um, quite timely, this month is actually the time to celebrate Vaccination Week in the Americas. So that will be celebrated on April 
20th to the 27th under the theme protect your community do your part so when we spoke about individuals who would opt or refuse to be vaccinated they're asking us to please do your part because without you giving consent and getting vaccinated we are at risk of Do, dr laws we don't we don't really have a problem i know you mentioned in in new york for example um among the a certain commu community mm, yes, they, they were yes. refusing to give consent but for their children to evacuate we, do we have we don't have that problem here do we it's creeping in slowly so yes uh, in St. Kitts and in nevis there are one or two parents who are opting out in terms of not providing consent for the vaccination of their children and so that's why earlier i said this is a good opportunity mm -hmm. for us to speak to those individuals and highlight this is a perfect example of what is happening if you as a mother or father refuse to uh, have your child vaccinated you are you are saying that it's your right mm -hmm. that's fine but in this community they have now put the entire new york area at risk for a disease that has caused affected 250 persons wow. and uh, <coughs> over 20 persons have been hospitalized and some of those a percentage of those have reached icu so your yeah, decision to, to 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 opt out not only impacts you and your child mm -hmm. but it impacts your community mm -hmm. actually it impacts the whole population where you live yeah because mm -hmm. we don't live on an island by ourselves no, no man uh -uh. is an island uh -uh. we're all interconnected yes. Yes. so Somehow today we live in community. a public health emergency was declared because of of of, of that mm -hmm. yeah so eventually we, so it has far, your decision your individual decision can impact the entire population. Now, what would be some of the reasons for people not wanting to vaccinate their children? One of what? the number one reason for ref refusal would be religious reasons. Religious. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you would find it's mostly the individuals of Rastafarian um, religious that they would refuse not to vaccinate. Okay. Most of the times, that's what we gather from the health center staff that that will be the number one reason for right. refusal. religious religious mm -hmm. purposes mm -hmm. for example the jews mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. um every male child mm -hmm. had to be circumcised mm -hmm. i don't know if they still have that as far as i know yes they still do I have that so. policy yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know although you know <laughs> in the medical field some people advise against circumcision yeah because you're removing part of the foreskin that has a lot of um, sensitive, you know, mm -hmm. you know what I'm mm -hmm. talking yes, about, yes, right? Yes. That can actually reduce pleasure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's being removed right. in, in, during the process. Yes. Right. Um, so, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we have to go to the phone lines with the time that we have left. So I'm going to open the phone lines. The numbers to call the overseas number one seven one eight. Five seven seven two nine one six. That's one seven one eight five seven seven two nine one six. And the local number is four six five twenty five fifty five. We await your calls. It's amazing that an insect so small can bring us to have all of this discussion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I wanted to add, uh, Mister. Such Wayne. great impact. Yes that's so true uh, one of the other interventions uh, that we utilize is well as you know chemical control uh, most persons are aware of the fogging yeah whereby you use an insecticide to to control the adult mosquitoes uh, however we also use larvicides in let's say you have and you know on our sugar estates you know have these big pot, copper copper pots, pots. 
pots. pots. <laughs> yeah, big mm -hmm. copper. The, the copper that yes. the cattle cattle use yeah, to drink water to drink from water water out of them. Right across by where you yes. live, Doctor Law. Yes, much. On Manchester <laughs> State, you used to have those. In big. fact, I think there was one day I don't know who removed it. Yes. I don't see it yes, now. Yes, I realize it was removed. Yes, right. actually, there were about two or three mm -hmm. on the entire estate when I was growing up. Right. Right. So uh, when you have big bodies of water. Uh, we the, the environment the vector control officers can use um, a, a chemical team of us or a bit mm -hmm. yeah. to, 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 to kill, kill the, the larvae right. in, in such okay. working for you good afternoon good afternoon let's why working for you my brother good afternoon Jamdo that's why I want to congratulate Miss Laws and the, the, the beautiful ladies them on the show today they're doing a wonderful job. But it's a pity some of the workers, them who work alongside them, don't give the 50%. Um, Mrs. Laws, I want to let you know that in the, in the Irish town area, it's very affected with a lot of nastiness in these abandoned houses. Mm -hmm. You know, we have, Miss Laws, you know, and I know, and that's why I should know that. Years ago, we all, mother and father, they were poor, you know. But they used to keep their surroundings clean. And these young people, Papa, my God, it's hell to tell the priest. That's why. <laughs> now, see, sometimes you walk through the, Mr. Oz, you must make sure that your officers, them, go through the alleyways, them. You know the alley from, from five ways, from Motion, come right over to pick up the alley? You must make them go through them. Because the government got some serious work to do. If I now breath, half of the population will go. Because it will start in these areas. New town a little better. Because they are able to touch his life, but he's doing the best. And I got to, as a here, I got to highlight this youngster, Africa. Africa, we want more youngsters to step up to the plate like Africa and Eli X and jam down. To see that the place clean, because we ain't going down the road with them, you know. We know how here used to run on the Robert Bracho. We had the old people down there in the health department. And when they come by your yard once, they're coming back twice. You're going to open the cell in them. And we're going to establish that here. So all these immigrants, I want them to know, you know. These things troubling me. And we're not going to see the right really. And I don't know why to bring these nastiness here. Miss Lamb, that's why I want to say one more thing before. Sure. That's why, you know, we allow a lot of people to come here. In the Caribbean, same people, different color, same people. But we don't need poverty stage. And the one in all these people in the McNight area and the Newton area go up to the VH and have one. Buy a piece of wire and hang out your clothes, tie them up in your yard and hang out your clothes here in the poverty state. Have a good day, let's try. Okay, jam down. Thank you. Hey. Working for you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hello? Yeah, as you were, as you were talking about vaccination, it's not just only Brooklyn. It started upstate first, and the Jews upstate refused to have the kids back. Then just yesterday, it started in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are you calling from New York? Yes, I am. Okay. 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 Nice to hear you. Mm -hmm. Hello? Yes, we are, we are hearing you. Is there anything else that you want to say? Thank you no, for I the... just want to tell you... <laughs> And like I heard you say earlier, when we was younger, we had a vaccination and the thing on our arm, yes. like a scar. Yes. So I, I, I heard while um, the doctor was saying it, is that vaccination for Jesus. What was the, the vaccination for? For tuberculosis. It's the BCG vaccine. That would give you that scar on your left shoulder. Right. Uh, you know, I thought that was for measles also, so no, uh -uh. that's why. Okay, the measles vaccination doesn't usually leave a scar. Okay. Yes. 
Yeah, I know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because every every like every six months you get a flu shot. Yes. Mm-hmm. Your doctor was your, your doctor was said to you, did you get your flu shot for the year? Mm-hmm. No, and then uh, another flu shot come out. They give they give you like four flu shots every year in New York. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for your contribution and for the clarification you made. Working for you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mister Williams. Good afternoon. And good afternoon to Dr. Malazi. You see me at six p.m. Good afternoon. And we are for you. No, I want to commend you coming on the radio to operate us on the H1N1 and all those diseases going around, plaguing and affecting we in this society. No, Miss Lord, you know you have some people, right? Do not be the doctor. Some people think the doctor are coming to us. They use the same thing. And the might that affected with, that, with, with whatever disease, maybe the, uh, the, the age one one, uh, some other bring the, bring the disease or whatever, and they don't go to the doctor. So th- those people know when the body gets shut down and they get sick, and you rush to the hospital, and sometimes when they get to the patient, they end up collapsed and pass because the doctor cannot do not much when they reach here because they don't take no medical attention at all. And a lot of these things happen. And when people end up going at rotation and all those things, uh, sometimes they go in a theater room, the doctors don't get blamed for that. You understand? A lot of these things take place. And people say, oh, I don't I want to go to the because I'm going to go to the hospital. But what happened that? These people do not take the check. You understand? Especially some, some men. And I believe that with the going around now, all kind of different diseases going around, plaguing our nation, and all kind of support here could affect you boys getting those diseases like mosquitoes. I believe that as a concerned citizen, I you concern about yourself. I believe that you should go to the doctor maybe every month. Uh, if you, you don't want to get money to go to month and take a check up and see what happens to the medical part about you. But you got some people that don't, they don't do that at all, at all, at all. And when they, when they go and they, 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 they pass the family members, they all kind of need to see what the doctor done. Anyway, wonderful program. God bless. Okay, thank you for your, your commentary. A very uh, good comment in terms of he's speaking to persons who would be ill. We have another caller. Oh. Working for you, good afternoon. Yes. Hello. Hello. Yes, we are hearing you. Oh, yes. Um, I'm calling on the health department, especially the environmental officers, to pay close attention to that mosquito pan that is at the foot of Cali Street. There's a mosquito pond up there? Mm-hmm. At the end of Cali Street, got going through the bridge. Mm-hmm. Where there's a always stagnant water. Okay. It's flushing it with some kind of oil or something. Put from the breeding of mosquitoes, you know? Mm-hmm. People pay close attention to it. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, fine. I think that would be our law, our last call. We have to wrap up this program. Mm-hmm. But Dr. Laws, uh, Dr. Mm-hmm. Liddy, you want to respond to okay. what some of the, the callers... The, the one before the last, he mentioned uh, persons who would be impacted with some of these infectious diseases. They stay at home, I suppose, trying home remedies and act try and then they progress and end up at the hospital quite late and they have negative outcomes and so it's important if you have the flu um, you need to to go check a physician 
you know, to get some input so that if you are at risk of pneumonia, it can be picked up early, managed aggressively. Same thing with dengue. If you think you are having dengue, my advice is to sh go to a physician and seek care and advice. Because if you are exhibiting any of the red flag signs, uh, which suggests you can go on to develop dengue hemorrhagic fever, you'll be picked up soon, managed aggressively, and have good or better health outcomes. Mm -hmm. So seek medical care. Right. So that was a good uh, contribution. Mm -hmm. And just to add to well, the admonition to really deal with any area where there's stagnant water, we would continue to increase the use of various methods which we spoke of before, one of those methods being the chemical um, control of the larvae. immature form of the mosquito, which is the larvae. So the area highlighted and other areas just like it would be um, good places to actually use this abate to kill the larvae in those stagnant water areas. Mm -hmm. yes. You know, I really want to commend Mr. Manners. Mm jam down because every week he calls in and he's very very passionate about the environment and how one should really take care of their environment and you hear that coming out so often in what he says and really and truly we must take note of what he's saying mm -hmm. because in our society we must teach environmental awareness because it is so true that a lot of the illnesses and so on that we have is because we are not environmentally aware of our surroundings and how we should really take care of our surroundings, the cleanliness of our surroundings. I used to hear when I was growing up, cleanliness is next to godliness and things like that. But a lot of the things around town and in the country and so on people throwing their things in guts um people throwing their things in drains and 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 you know the harmful you know repercussions of of, of very very serious repercussions mm -hmm. if you're going to block the drains up with your garbage it simply means that the, the just drain is just going to cause flooding if you're going to throw your garbage anyway and so on you are creating a lot of rats around the place yes. and so on mm -hmm. they creep into your homes and they cause disease they creep into food places and all kinds so that environmental awareness is what is so important and that is what i hear Mm -hmm. coming out yeah that's yes. our main message this afternoon to the general public uh today everybody we are imploring everyone to do a walk through start with your own home house home and immediate environment uh, and rid yourselves of all those receptacles where you would have uh the mosquito larvae growing yeah mm -hmm. and so yes environmental health the state of your immediate and not so immediate environment impacts your health it impacts everything now yes. we're, we're hearing about um, your environment and it, it impacts everything the social yes we even have to look yes. at the social environment what social environment am I really a part of Am I in an environment, you know, socially where people are positive and so on? Or I am in an environment where I'm influenced by all kind of negative things mm -hmm. that pulls me into gangs mm -hmm. and, 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 and get me involved in all kind of negative behavior? Um, what, am I, what am I really doing? How am I contributing to the climate and climate change? And mm -hmm. all of that has to do with the environment. Today we heard a lot of that, especially with the diplomats over at the who are here for the diplomatic week, which is going on. And one of the things that they were talking about is climate change. And that has to do with how we are aware and protect our, our environment. I'm hoping that what we shared on this program would be an impetus for even community groups to determine, okay, let's clean up our community so that we don't have a high density of mosquitoes. Yes. So you're talking about social environment, so community groups can come together, band together, and clean up communities. Everything is intertwined because yes. eventually it affects everything. Yes. It affects the economy. Yes. It, affects, it affects our social um, landscape. Mm -hmm. it, it, mm -hmm. it really affects everything. Mm -hmm. Because if people are going to be getting sick because of the environment, mm -hmm. 
you know, it's going to affect productivity, it's going to affect the economy, everything is so intertwined. And we depend on tourism. And we depend, we depend on, on the tourists. And if we have an outbreak, that's going to impact future visitors. That is correct. Yeah, so we it, 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 it has long-reaching, far-reaching effects. So we, we, we cannot underscore enough. No. Mm -mm taking care of the environment. Well, I want to thank <laughs> both of you for coming on today's program and quite an interesting discussion. Yes, yes. I you know, we are so. here discussing the Aedes aegypti. And you mentioned another one. Aedes albopictus. But you say we don't have that one here, Not right? Not so much. Not so much, good. But we have to do everything that we can to reduce our mosquito habitat and to limit exposure to mosquito bites. And I thank you so much for coming on today's program and for um, making our community aware of how we are supposed to really protect our environment and so we don't get sick because of our environment. You know, so Dr. Laws, thank you very much. And Dr. Liddy, thank you very much for coming. Dr. Laws is a veteran on this program. <laughs> And I know I will be seeing her again. So thank you very much. Thank you too for having us. <laughs> right. And you will come again to um, Dr. Liddy. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> thank you so much for tuning in today to Working For You. All of you who listened, all of you who called in, you know, with your concerns and your comments and your questions, we know that the environment means so much to you and you want to take care of it. Next week, we are going to be back with another edition of Working For You. And next week, we are going to have health officials again on this program to talk about Pogson. Pogson Hospital, which is celebrating its 127th anniversary. So we are going to have people like Mrs. Sonia Daly Finley on our program. Mm -hmm. Next week, we will see you. Until then, I am Les Roy Williams. Have a good one. <laughs> Working for you. A weekly talk radio program which highlights developments of national interest and the activities of your St. Kitts Davis government. Join host Les Roy Williams as he presents news, views, reports, and interviews about everything regarding the activities of the Team Unity government and the building of our communities and the development of St. Kitts Davis. Tune in and call in to interact with your government and share your views regarding the upward forward development of your community and our beautiful Twin Island Federation. Working for you is weekly, every Wednesday live from 1.30 p.m. to 3 p.m. on ZIZ Radio, with FM, and Sugar City FM with rebroadcast on participating stations. Working for you.